now we are aware that uh, the mahmud of ghazni muhammad ghori all these people had ventured into the indian subcontinent and uh, had won various wars looted india so on and so forth so before going into the details of those battles let us understand what was the foundation of these things for example the mahmud of ghazni coming from the ghaznavids so how was the ghazi empire or the ghaznavid empire itself was formed let us understand that so uh, during this time during the uh, 1000 ad uh, before that in fact during the end of the 10th century uh, there was this samanid empire samanid empire now this samanid empire consisted of course of the muslims now this samanid empire actually uh, is you can say uh, the territory the region of present day iran and the surrounding regions okay now this empire was surrounded by the turkish tribesmen all right that is the turks now these turks were non muslims all right so this samanid empire was surrounded by the turks the turkish tribesmen who were non muslims at their northern and eastern boundaries as a result of which there were lot of skirmishes battles small small battles so on and so forth continuously going on and since the religion over here was two different religion it also went on to became become the war of religion as a result of which these samanids considered themselves to be the defender of islam right as a result of which another group of army came out of this samanid army and they uh, special types of fighters they were known as the ghazis all right sorry so they were known as the ghazis now a very interesting thing happened what was that going forward it so happened that these turkish tribesmen who were non muslims they converted to islam all right so islamization of the turks took place giving rise to the islamized turks all right giving rise to the islamized turks not just that once they got converted into islam now these islamized turks now they themselves started defending islam in the region and the people there in so they themselves now became the defenders and not just the defenders going forward also the crusaders of islam so what do you mean by defenders of islam you are defending the religion the uh, people of the religion or the region of the religion so on and so forth from outsiders from others but at the same time they became crusaders of islam what does that mean not just that you are defending yourself but now you are going on to or into someone else's territory defend, defeating them and occupying them and expanding your own uh, religion or uh, people or territory so on and so forth so not just the defenders but also the crusaders these islamized turks became the defenders as well as the as well as the crusaders of islam now among among these samanid people there was uh, a turkish a turkish slave called alp tigin see the samanid power was declining right and now you have army within the army that is of the ghazis then you have the non muslim turks converting into uh, uh, islam and becoming muslims and then they themselves defending islam so you now have lots of fragmentation in this scenario alp tigin a uh, turkish slave established his own empire with ghazi a city in afghanistan with ghazi as its capital now in this context when this throne of this empire was taken by 
Mahmud of Ghazni, do we give rise to the Mahmud of Ghazni who would then come to India to loot India, to fight various battles, so on and so forth. But this is how the empire of Ghazi or the Ghaznavid empire with its capital at Ghazi came into existence. So we saw as to how the Ghaznavid empire was formed. All right. Now, in the Ghaznavid empire, Mahmud of Ghazni was the first, was the first independent ruler of the Ghaznavid empire. All right. So he ruled from 998 to 1030 AD. He was considered the hero of Islam. Now, why is so? Because we saw that the battle was going on, which turned into a religious battle. And, uh, you know, the Ghazis were known as the defender of Islam and also the crusaders of Islam. So when you are either defending a particular religion or uh, helping it expand in other regions, then of course you would become a hero of that particular re religion. As a result of which, uh, Mahmud of Ghazni became the hero of Islam. At the same time, he was associated and an important part of the renaissance of the Iranian spirit. Iranian spirit as in the Iranian culture, language, as in the Persian language which they have and the culture which they have. So he became associated with the renaissance of the Iranian spirit. Renaissance as in the resurgence, the resurgence reigniting or the resurgence of the Iranian spirit. Right. Now, at the same time, uh, he was, uh, Mahmud of Ghazni was, uh, uh, you know, hero of Islam at the same time. He was associated with the renaissance or the resurgence of the Iranian spirit. Now, of course, these rulers used to have their own poets, so on and so forth, who used to, you know, re-emphasize or, uh, you know, emphasize more on what all the ideology the king, the ruler had. So since the ruler, Mahmud of Ghazni, was a pioneer of the Iranian spirit. So, of course, any poet in his court would be propagating the same thing as a result of which the poet Firdosi, who was a poet in, the, in his court, in the court of Mahmud, wrote Shahnama, which did what? Nothing but glorified the Iranian heroes. And that's what happens. So whatever you will be writing, creating a play, act, so on and so forth, would be glorifying the ideology of the ruler. And the ruler was Mahmud of Ghazni, as a result of which his poet also glorifying the Iranian heroes. And so much so that later on, you know, Mahmud of Ghazni actually declared that or claimed that he is none other than but a descendant of an erstwhile Iranian king himself, that is Afrasiab. Afrasiab. So he later on went, so, so the patriotism with respect to Iran, the Iranian spirit was so strong that the king now needs to show that he is a descendant of an Iranian king. So as to win more people in his favor, as a result of which now he had claimed that. Whether it is certainly that or not is a different thing altogether, which may not be said with 100% assurance, but we can uh, safely say that Mahmud of Ghazni actually claimed to be the descendant of the Iranian king of Rasyab. Right. As a result of which we will see that Mahmud of Ghazni became more popular got more acclamation, so on and so forth. So we are seeing that the Mahmud of Ghazni, hero of Islam, associated with the Renaissance and this and that. But at the same time, the very same person, when it comes to India, with respect to India or the Indian subcontinent, would be nothing more than a plunderer. All right. So when it comes to the Indian subcontinent, all these titles, all these things are gone to dust. He is nothing. He is considered nothing but, but a plunderer. We'll see going forward. Why is that so? So as we saw that Mahmud of Ghazni was considered to be the defender of Islam, the crusader as well, right? However, when it comes to the Indian subcontinent in this region, he was not more than a plunderer. 
and a destroyer of the temples all right so much so that he uh, as per the estimates of various historians he had done 18 uh, 17 raids in totality all right total 17 raids he had made on the indian region in the uh, punjab haryana all these areas present day punjab and haryana areas and uh, regions above them all right thane sir which is a city uh, which is a town in haryana so he had raided thane sir he had raided peshawar so on and so forth right and now initially his raids were against the hindu shahi rulers now why were his raids initially against the hindu shahi rulers that is because before all these 17 raids all right before all these 17 raids what was happening the ghaznavid empire was anyhow expanding from the afghan region it was coming entering into the present day india it was expanding as a result of which the already present hindu shahi rulers could naturally estimate or logically deduce that of course the next targets will be us because you know if you have a force if you have uh, you know let's say this region and then you have this region right so if you have a force penetrating over here covering uh, uh, winning this area the or plundering this area then this area then this area then this area so of course people who are here or here the kings the rulers and all would understand that now later on moving forward it would be our regions which would be plundered all right as a result of which as a result of which we see uh, that ghazni was invaded by a hindu shahi ruler who was that ruler that was jaypal so jaypala basically invaded ghazni before all these aid, uh, raids by mahmud of ghazni it was jaypala who invaded ghazni now again this invasion was not with the intent of plunder or it is not to say that jaypala initiated everything as a result of which mahmud of ghazni had a valid reason for it no why this was done by jaypala as we understand that the expansion of ghaznavid empire was taking place it was entering into this region so there was a fear of course as a result of which jaypala had invaded ghazni along with whom along with one of the separated samanid ruler of ghazni so of course even in the enemy sides you would find some ruler who are not happy with uh, some some people some some commanders some important people and some uh, of the men of the army so on and so forth who are not happy with their, their ruler itself so one such person right samanid ruler of one such samanid ruler of ghazni actually supported jaypala and along with that samanid ruler of ghazni and an amir of multan an amir of multan who was himself a muslim person right so along with the help of this amir of multan and the samanid ruler of ghazni jaypala invaded ghazni however was defeated he was defeated now he was defeated at the same time he was the one who initiated of course with a valid reason but since he invaded ghazni that of course you know made them angry towards this ruler also as a result of which subsequent to the defeat of jaypala now we will see the retaliation by the ghaznavid empire now the ghaznavid empire would be retaliating against jaypala of course right now when this was happening when the invasion of ghazni by jaypala was going on it was prior to 19 998 it was prior to 998 that means mahmud of ghazni had not yet step on the th throne sat on the throne but however he was a part of the army of the ghaznavid empire so he has seen all that he has fought in the battle also in uh, from the side of Ghaz uh, uh, the ghaznavid empire and now jaypala has been defeated now uh, the ghaznavid empire would retaliate and plunder and fight and expand right and as a result of which because of this history between the hindu shahi ruler and the ghaznavid empire what happened is that when the mahmud of ghazni actually became the ruler in 998 right 
and during his entire tenure starting from 998 to 1030 he made it a point he made it a point and specifically paid a lot of heed when it comes to plundering and fighting the hindu shahi rulers and of course jaypala and his successors all right so moving forward we'll see how that happened hmm so here we'll see that as to uh, what all battles were fought when actually uh, the mahmud of ghazni came onto the scene so the uh, the bat we see that at 1990 998 ad sorry 998 ad mahmud of ghazni was sitting on the throne and very soon and very soon the battle of peshawar took place in 1001 ad all right in which mahmud of ghazni defeated jaypala right and all the territory west of indus so we see indus river flowing in the area of jammu and kashmir right this is this is this will be the eastern side and this will be the western side so all the territory on uh, to the west of the indus so they have reached till the indus now and all the territory to the west of the indus was given to or ceded to mahmud right this now this defeat was very difficult to handle and there are different legends about jaypala that he was imprisoned so on and so forth but the most valid uh, remarks by the historian say that jaypala actually uh, could not take the defeat and he committed suicide by uh, jumping onto a uh, pyre all right the fire all right now when he died he was succeeded by anandapala who was anandapala anandapala was the son he was the son of jaypala so of course he was uh, succeeded by his son anandapala now this uh, he is a son so he would of course want to take revenge right and at the same time Uh, you are looking to plunder again and again so mahmud of ghazni will not settle for all the territories up to the west also would want to go east also would go want to go to the southern territories also right as a result of which further plunders will happen and a full fledged war may also take place so another full fledged war took place in the year 1009 ad wherein mahmud actually defeated anandapala not just that he devastated their new capital nandana now under anandapala this what is nandana nandana was a new capital under the anandapal all right before that what were the capitals of uh, jaypala a day were peshawar then your wahind then your lahore so under jaypala there were three capitals which jaypala had under him anandapala took over from jaypala and established a new capital called nandana all right so after uh, anandapala was defeated by mahmud mahmud not just defeated him but devastated ran ravaged over his new capital nandana basically destroying anything and everything that moved all right but again we need to understand that still all this happened anandapala was defeated but he was still the king though of a lesser area more area was ceded but he was still the king so further in 1015 ad mahmud ousted anandapala threw him out of his own region so this can be understood to be you know the one final uh, nail in the coffin of the region of jaypala and his successor anandapala because here not just the defeat took place but anandapala was actually thrown out kicked out of his own region because previously what we saw what was happening jaypala was getting defeated territory was getting ceded anandapala got defeated territory was ceded things were devastated or you know broken everything shattered down by mahmud of ghazni but here not just that he was also thrown out of the region 
So they, these are the sequence of war. And please remember, very important from the prelims perspective, that there were three capitals under the reign of Jaipala, that is Peshawar, Wah, uh, Peshawar Wahind, La and Lahore. And the new capital was established by Anandapal, known as Nandana. Now, when we read history, when we understood it was very simple, okay, battle at Peshawar, then, then there was Anandapala who succeeded, then he was also defeated, then ousted, but it happened over a period of time. We saw that Mahmud of Ghazni took over in 998, right? Then the battle of Peshawar took place in 1001, right? Then the battle against Anandapala was in 1009, then Manandapala was finally ousted in 1015. So we see a period of 17 years. All right. What does that suggest? So let us have an account of the tussles between Mahmud and the Shahis. The Shahis, by Shahis, we mean the Hindu Shahis, the Hindu rulers. All right. So, of course, it was a prolonged tussle. It was a prolonged tussle. Why? Because, yes, a good amount of resistance was shown by Jayapala and later on by Anandapala. Right? Even though, even though we see that they were actually helped by just one Muslim ruler that was the Amir of Multan. Now, why? Why he was helped by just one Muslim ruler of course, not by others because we saw it had become a war of sort of a war of religion. Not We cannot completely say that it was because of that because there were various reasons, the plunder, the riches, the wealth, the expansion, the power and everything. But since two different religions were involved over here, so even that gave a great deal of motivation to the people. And that's why we say that Mahmud was called the defender and crusader of Islam. So then why? Why a Muslim ruler of Multan was then helping, even though it was one, but why even that one was helping the Mahmud of Ghazni? That is because that even in Islam, there are different sects or different sections or different, uh, you know, layers. Uh, that they that there's not a concept of caste like thing, but similar to that, if we can call, there are different sections or different sects of Muslims as well. So the Amir of Multan, the ruler of Multan, belonged to a different sect than that of Mahmud of Ghazni. As a result of which, they both also were having enmity against each other. Now to for and at the same time, not just that, not just that. Mahmud of Ghazni had plundered this region also, right? So he had plundered this region also. Probably that is the reason because he may not care much about someone of a different sect. And also, of course, his economic or financial reasons were also there. So he had already plundered once before. These two belong to two different sects of Islam as a result of which, as a result of which the Amir of Multan helped Jayapala. But at the same time, he was the only one who has helped Jaipala. And it is very surprising to see that none of the Rajput rulers came to the aid of Jaipala. Later on, later on, when the historian Farishta wrote about Mahmud of Ghazni, he did mention that a lot many Rajputs had come in uh, the aid of Jaipala. But that probably the other historians actually uh, refute that, saying that that is said only to show how great or amazing Mahmud of Ghazni was and how powerful he was that even though all the Hindu rulers had combined, still he defeated them. So probably that was said in order to glorify him. But what the actual or what is the, you know, consensus on? The consensus, consensus is on the fact that Actually, none of the Rajput rulers had aided Jaipala. And he was all alone, just helped by one Muslim ruler of Multan. Right? As a result of which, of course, if, if, if Rajputs, other Rajputs would have held, uh, helped him, probably the story would have been different. But the consensus among the historians is that none of the Rajput rulers had helped him. As a result of which, he did not have much of support against an army of you know, at times 30, 40,000 men of Mahmud of Ghazni, even for plundering, 
uh, he used to have a very big army so as a result of which uh, they were defeated time and again and however they did show great resistance against mahmud of ghazni now the mahmud of ghazni also uh, went into uh, the indo gangetic plain so his expeditions also uh, you know penetrated through the indo gangetic plain now uh, as we saw majorly it they were the plunders which were done and not settlement as such but at the same time we need to understand what were the reasons for such things was it just uh, the the greed of money and just they just keep on getting as much wealth as possible and keep collecting it that was one of the things but at the same time there was the need of this wealth for mahmud of ghazni so what was that need see basically we saw uh, that these ghaznavids the the people of the ghaznavid uh, empire in uh, the ruler including the ruler the mahmud of ghazni were fighting battles on various fronts here they were coming into the indian subcontinent plundering and going back but at the same time they were fighting battles in central asia as well and to fight battles in central asia they needed wealth resources so on and so forth so from where to get it to get it from an easier source a weaker source whom you can defeat or plunder easily gain the wealth and come and utilize those wealth and fight you know probably more difficult battles over here right as a result of which we would see that so much of plundering was done so when it when we talk about mahmud's expedition into the indo gangetic plain they were aimed at plundering at plundering rich temples and towns now why temples temples of course because they were rich temples having millions of followers uh, you know people coming over there and uh, donating things so the temple itself has a lot of riches so that's one thing rich temples and rich towns so that you can loot as much as you can and at the same time it can also be that you are destroying the symbols of the opponents whom they basically worship right it's a place of worship so you are also making a statement as well but at the same time you are getting a lot of riches as well from that so their plunder was aimed at basically uh, the rich temples and towns right and of course one of the reason we saw was their fights going on in central asia as a result of which they used to use the wealth to fight the enemies in central asia right so what all regions did mahmud actually plundered punjab then thanesar a city in present day haryana kannauj somnath temple in gujarat right and at the same time uh, this word plundering can be related to this fact that they came for plundering because there was no attempt to annex any region that i will annex this region make it mine and either i will rule it or have some proxy some representative of mine to rule nothing like that simply plunder and no attempt to annex the region now especially when it comes to somnath temple why somnath temple one of the very richest temple as well at the same time the city the city was a port city when it is a port city there would be a lot of trade as a result of which lot of wealth right so these were the reasons why this all you know all the other regions were of course wealthy especially this somnath temple and the region the city or the area surrounding it because of course for the fact that it was a port city so this is all about the expeditions of mahmud into the indian subcontinent also remember probably a mains question can come talking about whether it was only to plunder or to uh, uh, you know probably settle so on and so forth what could have been the reasons of plundering discuss so please remember a very important reason is the fight going on in central asia for which they needed money as a result of which as a result of which you would very interestingly see that the mahmud's plunders used to be alternate with the fights going on in central asia for example you have central asia and here you have the indian subcontinent all right 
सो नाउ वॉट विल हैपन महमूद विल कम ओवर हियर प्लंडर टेक द वेल्थ गो हियर फाइट द बैटल देन कम हियर प्लंडर टेक द वेल्थ फाइट द बैटल so on and so forth so this was alternating he would come here what all he has won utilize there fight over there either lose it or win it gain some ground then come back for more resources and wealth and take them back again fight them win lose whatever then you need more then you come back again like this historian says together in all he had made 17 raids in india all right so and of course remember for even for your prelims fact that there were no attempts to annex all right and this is what uh, no uh, no attempts to annex no attempts to settle down this is what also differentiates mahmud of ghazni from the mughal rulers also who came with uh, you know uh, even if not uh, with the thought of settling down but later on actually settled down actually annexed and also settled down but when it comes to mahmud of ghazni no attempt to annex as a result of which no attempt to settle down in india now we saw uh, that the mahmud of ghazni used to raid india the indian subcontinent region and then use the same wealth plundered from uh, the indian subcontinent in the fights uh, which were going on in central asia so uh what happened in central asia going forward is that a seljuk empire a very prominent and a strong empire came into existence now we'll uh, try to understand how uh, and when did these raids stop and why they never converted into an establishment of course there was no intention also but at the same time there was the decline of the ghaznavid empire that is what we will be seeing over here so uh, we know that the central asia there were tussles going on so the seljuk empire had come into prominence all right and over there if we see the seljuk empire consisted of the present day syria iran and trans oxania now when we talk about trans oxania uh, trans oxania consisted of the present day the regions of the present day uh, uzbekistan kazakhstan kyrgyzstan right so all these region, regions were present uh, where uh, part of the trans oxania and the seljuk empire consisted of trans oxania plus iran parts of iran not all of iran parts of iran and syria the northern parts of iran was still not under the seljuk empire and it was this northern part of iran for which the seljuk empire was tussling with the uh, ghaznavid empire right so uh, in 1030 ad mahmud of ghazni died and he was succeeded by his son musad all right now musad was then later on defeated by the seljuks he was defeated as a result of which he need to run away from there and come back to uh, the area of punjab right and as a result of these defeats the tussle were continuously going on and since the seljuk empire defeated musad the ghaznavid empire actually shrank all right now the ghaznavid empire shrank so once the empire shrank any possibility of expansion any how shrinks down because now you are fighting for survival but the raids actually help because you are still probably powerful then uh, the places where you are going for raids so the ghaznavid raids still continue right but over a period of time please understand that this ra these raids started uh, since the time of mahmud of ghazni uh, since he took uh, power, uh, control right and now it's over 30 years right so even though the raids kept on continuing there were certain indian empires which started rising up becoming more powerful and subsequently becoming able to counter these raids so slowly and steadily even the raids declined and it stopped so this is how the ghaznavid empire came to its basic decline it kept on existing in a very small area near the regions of punjab but it was as good as uh, basically it did not pose any threat whatsoever uh, then on to the indian subcontinent region